Good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, um, coming in on such an early morning and uh, starting your conference off with a preclinical workshop. But hopefully, um, you can take something away from around eye care and eye care disorders. So, the intent behind today is to uh, touch on hopefully some of the things that you see in your day to day practice. Um, some of the information may be a little bit basic or maybe sort of refresher, something you've heard before, something you already know. Hopefully you can come away with some new information. Uh, the rule is there are no rules. You can put your hand up, you can yell out and ask questions. There's no problems. Um, we can discuss whatever you need to discuss. Uh, we may not finish the presentation. I might get, get asked back to come again, but that's okay. Um, but more than happy to uh, talk about any questions you have during the presentation. So don't feel free to just sort of interrupt and make this as interactive as possible. Uh, on the flip side, I will do the same. So uh, hopefully as part of my role will be to engage with you and to see whether or not I can get some information from you about what you know and what you would do in your practice. Um, so it would be good if we could have some sort of engagement and sort of some, some interaction there. Um, so we're going to basically go through both the front and back uh, aspects of, anti of eye disease. We're going to go through some eye disease that you're going to see at the front of the eye, things that you're likely to see at the back of the eye. Uh, well, you may not see at the back of the eye, but you'll actually, um, through the patient interaction, patient encounters that you have, you may very well ha encounter patients that have these eye diseases and there'll be flow-on effects as well. What we will do is we'll start with just a little bit of an overview of what optometry is, um, and the basics about the eye, and then we'll get straight into it. So I don't necessarily prefer the podium because I feel like it puts a barrier and doesn't become as interactive, but let's try and make this as interactive as possible. So common eye conditions and the primary, um, and the primary health care nurse. So we're going to talk a little bit about who's who what role everybody plays. Everybody has a different role and everybody works together collaboratively and that's why we're here. I'm going to have a little bit of an overview on the, on the eye health in Australia and sort of what the statistics show and what, what where we're at at the moment and what we can do um, to prevent um, eye disorders and a little bit of a very basic overview on the eye itself. Don't jump out of your seats and run off. We're not going to go through all these eye diseases. So this is just an overview of some of the common things that you may see. Okay, so... Um, you can all read, you don't need me to read them out for you, but these are just some of the things that they might already be jumping out and things might be sparking sort of ideas in your head. And we're going to talk a little bit at the very end about dealing with an eye health problem, what to do, what to do when it's emergency, what to do when it's something that we can actually treat in practice, in your practice and the like. Okay, so who's an optometrist? An optometrist is a primary eye care provider. Okay, so it's similar to a primary health care provider in GP land. We're a primary eye care provider. Okay, people come into us off the street. They don't need a referral. Um, generally, it's all done by Medicare. It's a university course. There are some courses that are postgraduate, like Melbourne University, Deakin University does a, a master's course, and then there are obviously other courses around the country, Flinders and UNSW and the like. Medicare provides a rebate on most optometry consultations, and they don't need to, they don't need a referral to see an optometrist. There's almost no waiting time in most places. Occasionally, you might have to wait a few hours or a day if it's a very busy practice. Uh, optometrists can fast track referrals straight to ophthalmology. Um, there's no restriction. There are some healthcare providers and allied health providers that actually can't refer. Optometrists are able to prov provide referrals straight to ophthalmology. More than half of the optometrists in Victoria alone are therapeutically endorsed, which means they can prescribe S4 medication, um, well, a list of S4 medication that's been endorsed by the optometry board. How it works, the optometry board has endorsed therapeutic endorsement. It was a mandatory part of the degree from 2002 that required additional training. It was a graduate certificate in ocular therapeutics. So if somebody like myself who didn't, who graduated before 2002, what you needed to do was to go back and actually go through um, this graduate certificate to be able to, to prescribe S4 medication. As I said, about 50% of optometrists and about 45 topical only. So there's no sort of oral or IV or intramuscular or anything like that. It's purely topical drops that optometrists can prescribe. Uh, and glaucoma patients are generally managed through shared care with ophthalmology, so a lot of the time an optom optometrist will actually uh, diagnose glaucoma in a patient. We'll go through what that is. Um, and then send the patient off to the ophthalmologist. If the ophthalmologist is happy, start, initiate treatment, and then send them back to the optometrist. 
More recently, optometrists have actually been um, endorsed to diagnose and initiate treatment. So you may end up seeing patients that have been diagnosed and initiate and started on glaucoma drops through the optometrist. So don't be surprised. Again, some of these might just jump out and look familiar. Hopefully they all do. The ones that don't, you can ask about if you like. But they're all different classes of drugs and tropi topical drops that optometrists can prescribe um, <coughs> that, uh, that you may see in your general practice that your patients may be on um, or, in, or in wherever, wherever you are practising. Uh, a couple of them are private prescriptions only that aren't on the PBS, but for the most part, most of them are on the PBS question. Absolutely. So, apart from the uh, apart from the percentage of therapeutically endorsed, all the information that will be presented will generally be sort of na nationally. Um, so, um, yeah. So, for example, all these drops can be can be uh, prescribed by optometrists if you're registered with the Optometry Board of Australia anywhere in the country. Uh, was there anything else that was specific to Victoria that you wanted me to sort of speak? just in general? Yeah. Cool. So eye health in Australia, 800,000, too big a number, okay? We're only talking four years from now. So it's a fairly uphill battle that we're facing, okay? The good news is that 75% of the loss, the vision loss in Australia is preventable or treatable. We're talking about things that are in, <coughs> things that are in, the, green, in the green list down the bottom there. So macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, these are things that generally with age and with time Sometimes they're sort of unavoidable. We can manage them. We can try and treat them best, keep the diabetes level at the right, at the right level for, to avoid eye problems. The ones in the green are definitely manageable. Cataract surgery. Cataract surgery is a four to five minute procedure. It's a day surgery now. You're in, you're out, your vision's back to normal. Shouldn't be part of the 800,000. Glaucoma, picked up early, treated with drops. It's like hypertension. Okay, people can live for years and years and years on their glaucoma medication and have no ocular side effects. Shouldn't be part of the 800,000. And obviously the big kicker is the bottom one there. Refractive error, short-sighted, long-sighted, astigmatism, things that baffles the mind that in 2016 we're still talking about being part of 800,000 people being, having, uh, having sort of vision loss by 2020. So as I said, the, hill, the, the battle is uphill, but it isn't, as, it isn't all doom and gloom. And we are all essentially as healthcare providers, part of the team that should be battling vision loss and preventable blindness in Australia. What you'll notice there is I've got that prevalence increases threefold with each decade over 40. So I would presume, and pardon, pardon me if I'm incorrect, but I would presume that a lot of the patient encounters that you have are with patients over 40. And in, that, in most cases, they're going to come with a lot of other systemic conditions and other conditions that, are, that have ocular manifestation. So it's always important to start thinking a little bit about what else could be going on behind the scenes in terms of eye disease. Okay, no brainer. As we get older, we're more prone to having vision loss and blindness. And it's the, it's the, older, the older generation, it's, the, it's the, the last two columns there, last three columns there to your, to your right that we need to be starting to be more mindful of. Question? Mm. When you say laser surgery, do you mean sort of to correct yes. refractive error or diabetic, diabetic retinopathy? Yeah, so I mean, they're in the same boat as anybody else. Glaucoma is a condition, we'll go through it later in the, in the, in the workshop, but glaucoma is something that there are some fairly significant risk factors. Myopia, high myopia is one of them. Um, age is another significant one. Race is another significant one. And that there's, there shouldn't be any difference whether that person has had um, refractive surgery or not. Uh, refractive surgery doesn't include or exclude them from being more prone to eye disease. So it's a combination of other risk factors that come together that would actually create that risk, that risk profile. Okay, some of the things, before we get into the nitty gritty, I'm just sort of a bit more of an overview. Some of the things that we need to start thinking about when we're seeing our patients and to sort of just consider when it comes to their best, you know, best, best care for them and their, and their eye health. Family history is a big one you know, in eye disease. We're talking things like glaucoma, keratoconus, macular degeneration, a lot of these things, yes, they have other risk factors, 
but family history is a big one. Age is another one, diabetes, any change in their vision and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander is generally more at risk of having significant eye disease. So today what we want to do is to recognise symptoms of common problems and to refer when necessary. Talk to your patients about their vision. Okay, so a lot of, the, like I said, a lot of the systemic conditions will have ocular manifestations. It may just take a quick question for them to trigger that, oh yeah, actually I haven't been seeing as well. Or yeah, I've, actually there was something on the road or there was something the other day that I couldn't see as I was driving my grandkids to, to school or whatever it might be. So it's just, just a way to trigger them to talk to them. Um, encourage them to talk to their GP or to a health professional about their eyes, get them to go and get, tell them to go and get their eyes tested and reassure them that a lot of the eye tests are covered by Medicare. You'd be surprised how many people, professional and non-professional, those in health and those outside that don't know that optometry is generally covered by Medicare, that there's 32 Medicare items and for 97% of optometrists still bulk bill without a referral. So people sort of feel like there's so many barriers to accessing eye care when there really isn't. And it's just about that sort of subtle education. And think about the secondary conditions that can result of their eye, of their eye disorders. Things like falls, depression, hip fractures and, and the like. So there's a lot that goes into what can happen. And we'll talk a little bit, we'll touch briefly on what, what it is that um, we see mainly in, in sort of geriatric, geriatric settings and, and aged care facilities around sort of some of the common issues that are faced around people that have eye disorders and the flow and effects of that. And advise your patients, stop smoking, okay? Protection, ultraviolet protection, protection from injury. You know, we've still got a lot of patients that are, you know, the older patients, the older demographic that are still, you know, working at home. They have very little to do during the day. They're doing their weeding, they're doing their gardening and there's lots of little bits of information we can give to provide to our patients around eye protection and being able to, to sort of protect their eyes in the, in the long run and maintain good health, obviously. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay, a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a very basic anatomy lesson around what we're going to be talking about today. So before I get into some of the conditions, I thought it might be good just to overview what we've got in the eye. So you know, obviously the pupil is the central part, the black aperture where the light gets through. We have um, the iris, which is the coloured part of the eye, and then in front of that we have the cornea and we have the the, the, the tear film. Um, I won't go into a lot more detail. The conjunctiva is the white part, is, is the clear layer above the white part of the eye. The white part of the eye is called the sclera. And a lot of the conjunctivitis conversation we'll have today will be, it will be sort of concerned with that, with that clear layer above the white part of the eye. This is taking a cross section of the eye, so slicing halfway through the eye and just looking at it from the side. As I said, you've got the iris there. In front of the iris, you've got the cornea. You've got, you're not going to hear me with that, but I'll move anyway. You've got the lens here. The lens here is where you have, um, where you get cataracts. A lot of people don't understand that cataracts, they say cataract is a film on the front of the eye. I'm sure some of you have heard that either from relatives or from patients that the, cornea, the cataract is a film on the front of the eye. Incorrect. A cataract is a clouding of the lens inside the eye. So this is the lens. This looks like a, if you wear spectacles, it's like a spectacle lens, but it's just a bit thicker. And that gets cloudy over time. It's not an eye disease, it's just ageing. Okay? I tell all my, my patients, it's just like having grey hair or wrinkles. It's just an ageing process. Okay? You do not have an eye disease. It's not something you'll go blind from. It's simply removed. A brand new one is put in. It takes three to four minutes and you go home seeing perfectly. Question? Then why do those patients have to wait years before they get surgery? That's an issue with the public system. So... Yeah. Okay. So there's two aspects to that answer. As I said, initially the problem is that um, ophthalmologists see such severe cases. So what happens is when they see someone who's got one line drop in vision, for example, or a line and a half drop in vision, they won't consider that severe. It's all relative. So some ophthalmologists will say, you can wait another 12 months. It's very slowly progressing. So generally when someone presents with cataracts where they've lost vision, they've probably had clouding of the lens for like 15 years. And it's very, very, very slowly going sort of from, 
you know, a light shade of yellow to sort of deeper yellow to a brown, and then eventually they can't see. By that stage, they've had that, that lens is going cloudy for about 20 odd years. Um, that's one issue. The other issue, like I said, is that in the state system, because these patients that are seen get pushed to the bottom of the list because they've only lost one line of vision, the people that take road are the ones that are sort of your six on 12, six on 15, they've lost four or five lines of vision, they can't drive anymore, they take priority. And because everybody gets cataracts, it's just, I mean, the, the, it's, it's inevitable that it's going to be such a long list. The only thing I might differ with you on is that I can send patients, and I have sent patients as recently as only a couple of weeks ago to an ophthalmologist, and within, so they'll, they might get an appointment in a couple of weeks, and then they might be booked in for surgery probably four to six weeks after that, um, depending on who you send the patient to and um, how busy that practitioner is. But no, ophthalmo no private ophthalmologist should be asking patients to wait three or four months because um, there are people that are willing to do it. There are ophthalmologists willing to do it much sooner than that. Um, but yeah, so reassuring the patient that cataracts are normal, everybody gets them, you remove the lens, you put a new one in, you're okay, everything's fine. And um, we'll talk a little bit about patients that are, work, that are living in sort of residential aged care and nursing homes and the regimen of drops that they're on and how that can be quite confusing for them in those settings. We'll talk about that towards the end. Um, that's your retina at the back of the eye, optic nerve which allows you to see, captures all the light, sends signals to the brain, back to the eye and away you go. <clears throat> the retina starts from here and goes all the way through the back of the eye. Okay? It's 10 layers thick, 10 layers worth of cells. It's about the thickness of glad wrap. You can imagine what happens to a patient that's short-sighted, short-sighted patient, can't see, you can't see in the distance. What happens with that short-sighted patient is their eye is bigger than normal. So if a normal person's eye is like that, a short-sighted person, their eye is like that. Okay? Now what happens to the retina when the, when the eye goes from there to there? The retina stretches. You stretch a piece of glad wrap over time and ultimately what can happen is they can have a retinal detachment. So the higher the short-sighted, the thicker their glasses, the higher the minus number on their prescription if they're short-sighted, the more at risk they are of, of uh, retinal detachment and retinal trauma. You've stretched that same eye, the optic nerve. The optic nerve. The only part of the body where you can see the brain from the outside. The optic nerve is the second cranial nerve and it's the only part of the brain that you can see from outside the body. Amazing. That optic nerve stretches. Cells die, you get glaucoma. So people that have high short-sightedness or high myopia are also at risk of glaucoma. The higher the short-sightedness, the more the risk. We can go on for hours, but I'll, this is supposed to be a 10-second slide, so I'll keep moving. <coughs> so we've just gone from... That, we're going to start looking in now. Okay, so we're sitting right here and we're going to be looking into the eye. That's what we see. That's your retina. These are all the blood vessels and arteries and veins. That's the optic nerve. That's the part of the brain that I was telling you about. That's what you can see when you look, when the, you might have seen it if you watch medical shows or you've been to the optometrist and they look in the eye with the light. They look in at that and they make sure that that optic nerve looks healthy they make sure that your macula is healthy. So the macula, you've heard of macular degeneration. If you're looking at me, or you're looking at the slide right now, you're using your macula. So the macula is used for that central vision, that fine, sharp, focused vision. So when people have macular degeneration, when people have exudates and fatty tissue and hemorrhages at the macula, you can imagine that's gone. Vision's gone, central vision's finished. On the other side, the optic nerve head is what gets damaged, as I said, with glaucoma. When that happens, your peripheral vision starts to go first. So glaucoma, peripheral vision, macular degeneration, your macula is gone, it's your central vision. <clears throat> okay, that's it. We're going to get into it, okay? So this is where I need everybody to sort of, can't sort of sit back now and sort of listen to me. I'm going to start seeing whether or not I can get something out of you. We're going to go through three main conditions at the front of the eye and then two at the back of the eye. I have no idea whether or not we're on time. We'll find out at the end, okay? So, conjunctivitis, I hope you all know that. If you've got kids, grandkids, or you've had it yourself, or you've, you've dropped somebody off at a childcare, you know that conjunctivitis is something that everybody gets. It can happen in kids probably more often because bacterial conjunctivitis is quite contagious and kids love to share things. I've got two, and they just take things off each other all the time. Uh, dry eye, probably a bit more of an older age group, okay? And contact lens compl complications, across the board, okay? 
Patient attends your practice. Okay, I've left it fairly generic. I don't know what practice you all work in, so I'm going to sort of just leave it open. Whichever practice you work in, a patient attends with one right eye, one, not one eye, one red eye. What do you ask? How long have you had it? What else? Any discharge? Good. Itchy. Painful. Change in vision. Perfect. Family history. Trauma. Perfect. Yeah, what happened? Yeah, welding. Yeah, welding. Good one because it's, a, it's one that gets missed and unless something's sticking out of the eye, people don't volunteer that information. Oh, you've been swimming. Swimming, yeah. So have you been in any environment? What environment have you come from? Let's see if you've missed anything. Have you worn contact lenses? When did it happen? Vision, pain, discharge, trauma, allergies, brilliant. We got them all. General health is another one that most people forget. Yeah? Have you had the flu? Any headaches? Big things, right? Because these things essentially will give us our diagnosis, will tell us what, what it is that's going on. <clears throat> we good? Can I move on? Yeah. Wait a couple of minutes. So just an idea. You don't have to ask them all. I mean, the ones that come to mind are all good but just to start to trigger. And, you know, a lot of the time the patient, well, not a lot of the time, I'll be careful, some of the time the patients volunteer the information um, and sometimes we have to really pull it out of them. Signs of conjunctivitis. Redness, painful, thick discharge, sometimes it can be pussy, sticky eyelids in the morning, burning, itchy, quite watery, okay? Conjunctivitis, there's three main causes. Bacterial conjunctivitis, there's particular, particular strains of bacteria that cause it and generally it can be quite contagious, like I said, which is why it's so much fun at childcare. So if someone's <coughs> Absolutely not. I can tell you firsthand, it makes no difference. <laughs> um, yeah, kids will pick it up because it goes through hand and eye contact. Kids are sort of sharing things all the time. And it's not just kids. I mean, what happens is sometimes people... Families share towels and all sorts of things at home. Be careful not to share towels if you can avoid it um, with people that have conjunctivitis. And these are sort of the, the, some of the things that will, will come up, the, 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 pussy, the pussy discharge and the sticky eyelids. They're the things that basically tell you what your diagnosis is and the, that it's, it's actually bacterial conjunctivitis. Viral conjunctivitis, a little bit different. There's a couple of different causes for it, Okay. Highly contagious and something that generally comes with the flu. Okay, so we say to a patient, have you been sick? Have you had a bit of a cold lately? Um, I had my brother-in-law just a couple of weeks ago. So my eyes already rang me. It's really red and it's watery. I said, what's going on? He said, oh, I've been sick for a week. I said, bingo. You look really cool because you know the answer straight away. You tell them what it is. What, how do you fix viral conjunctivitis? What do you do? Nothing. Okay? It's even better because you've given them the answer, you've given them the diagnosis and you'll tell them in seven days it'll be fine and it will be. Okay? So you can impress your friends. So that's the second one, viral conjunctivitis. Allergic conjunctivitis, a different one again. So we've actually broken conjunctivitis down now into three completely different components. This one is an immune response. Okay? It can either be a delayed onset type 4 or an immediate one type 1. We've probably all experienced the immediate one. You walk past you know, some sort of, on a windy day and bang, you get some pollen or you get something and it's just itchy nose, runny eyes. It can be seasonal, okay? Some poor sufferers can actually get perennial allergic conjunctivitis, so it's sort of all year round. Um, it's generally worse during springtime, but it doesn't necessarily, um, it's not just exclusive to springtime. Um, and you can also get a couple of other less common ones, vernal, atopic. Atopic is the one that generally comes with sort of skin reactions as well and papillary conjunctivitis, which is sort of the cobblestones that you sort of see. If you flip the lids, I don't know if you've ever had kids or grandkids or, or siblings that have ever flipped their lids, but you can sort of see under the lids a cobblestone effect, which is the inflammation that comes from that allergic reaction in the eye. Okay? And so generally anyone that attends an optometrist, when they say, I've got an itchy eye and it's red and it's watery and whatever, flip the lid and we'll start to see all these cobblestones and we can grade them, they're sort of my, you know, moderate or mild or severe or whatever it might be. And the only way to deal with that inflammation will be generally for sort of a, a mild steroid. Question? How do you differentiate the cold stones with 
sort of trachoma. Trachoma generally will be the, the, the sort of lashes turning in, creating that scarring on the cornea. This is under the eyelid. Yeah. So follicles generally in the, in the lower lower fornix. Yeah, as opposed to the upper lid. Yeah. Um, I hope so. I don't know. I might. Being able to differentiate between the two. Yeah. They're little white dots. Cobblestones don't have that white sort of that white head to them. Um, if I don't have a if I don't have a picture of it, I can show you one after we're done. Okay. So just to um, give you a bit of a checklist to go over to think about sort of what it is. Um, when you want to sort of pinpoint or narrow down what sort of conjunctivitis, because this will ultimately determine your uh, your treatment. So bacterial, like I said, I don't want to read. I know you guys know all know how to read, so I won't read for you. But some of the main things: eyelids stuck together and puffy. Viral is generally watery. Okay, there's no pus involved, and it comes with the common cold, and you don't have to do much about it. Um, a lot of the time with viral, as I didn't mention earlier, it can go to the other eye. So you can get it for seven or ten days and it can go to the other eye. Okay? So people rubbing their eyes using towels, those sort of things, their own towel even, and they can actually transfer it. An allergic, um, usually seasonal, usually both eyes. So you generally won't get an allergic reaction, allergic conjunctivitis in one eye. Um, and it's fairly mild. Normally use Zatitin, which is over the counter, or Patinol on a script. Um, Patinol, interestingly enough, actually takes a couple of weeks to stabilise the mast cells. So someone that's come in with an allergic conjunctivitis, you put them on patinol, it ain't going to work. At least not for the first couple of weeks. And what you might do is year after year, when you've seen the patient a couple of years in a row, you sort of say, okay, from the beginning of August to the middle of August, let's start you on patinol so that we stabilise those mast cells before springtime. Okay, and that way when springtime comes... I've got to stop doing that. When springtime comes you actually have those mast cells actually stable, you don't get the release of histamine and they're fine during... And they have to obviously continue using it throughout the three-month the three month period of spring, but it generally is sort of less severe or non-existent. Is that cool? Yeah, questions on that? Good. Okay. Non-drug therapy. So some of the things that we can think about, that's sort of non-drug therapy. Avoid the allergens, okay? Staying indoors, generally not something that we can always do. Um, Protective pillows and bedding, removing carpets and rugs during springtime, um, high temperature hot water laundry wash generally can can sort of be fairly good for any sort of allergens that are in the in the where you're uh, and showering at bedtime is actually quite good because apparently not apparently what happens is you get quite a few allergens in your hair during the day and if you don't shower at bedtime what can happen is you can actually end up sort of having that effect inside, sort of within your eyes and nose and throat during the night. So always good to have a good shower before bedtime. Um, and a HEPA filter can remove almost 100% of particles. Cold compressors, very good for viral and allergic, probably not as good for bacterial conjunctivitis. It sort of stops the itch because you get less degranulation of the mast cell and also it, um, it constricts the blood vessel so it looks a bit better as well. Okay, OTC medication. Not great to use these long term. Okay, um, what happens is people present with the red eye, and they think I'll get something from the chemist to fix my red eye. Okay, what happens is you actually get a rebound effect. So these vasoconstrictors, they constrict the blood vessels. They have a very small amount of phenylephrine in the in the drop, not enough to dilate your pupil, just enough to constrict the blood vessels. And it's okay for one off going to a wedding or you've got an event or something like that, it's okay to use. But continuous use actually ends up resulting in a toxic effect where you actually end up getting rebound congestion. You actually get red eye from using the red eye drops. I don't know. I won't, I won't pretend I do. I haven't heard about that. If, it, if that's the case, I, I'm not sure whether that's still the case or not because I think people are using it now. But I stand corrected if, if, you, if that's the case. Okay. So it's probably not conjunctivitis, okay? They say there's no trauma, no allergies. Um, my general health is good. I don't have a flu. Um... 
discharges water, it's a maybe viral, but still you're not convinced that it's viral. Um, the pain is mild, okay, so it's not sort of, um, generally with conjunctivitis you don't get any pain, okay, it's sort of more itchy or more sort of red, but it's not painful. Um, my vision is variable, so it can't be the conjunctiva, it can't be the conjunctiva. As soon as vision's involved, we know that it's more significant than conjunctivitis, which is the central part. Happened last night, could be conjunctivitis, but unlikely. And yes, I do wear contact lenses. Okay, so I think maybe dry eye. So, this is the front of the eye. Okay, as we look at the eyes, this is the front of the eye. We have the cornea, which is the clear layer on the front. And then on, in front of the cornea, anterior to the cornea, we have the tear film. The tear film is made up of three layers. A mucin layer that connects the cornea to the watery layer. The watery layer is the thickest layer that actually allows for um, the lubrication and the moisturing of the eye. And then we have a lipid layer. Why do we have a lipid layer on top of the aqueous layer? It doesn't evaporate. Okay. So it is a lot more complex than what I've made it out to be, but that's probably the gist of it for the time being. Symptoms of dry eye, we've all had it discomfort, sometimes you can get a bit of a dry eye um, sort of visual disturbance from that dry eye um, and there's so many reasons why you can get dry eye, we'll go through them. So here's some of the symptoms, okay, red, watery, blurred vision, all that sort of stuff. How do we get dry eye? What are the, some of the external factors? Age, well age is probably internal. Environment, yeah. What sort of environment? Air condition, smoking. If you say air condition, you also would say heating. 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 Good, yeah. I can't hear you all. Sorry. General health. General health. Yeah, it's internal. Good. Okay. Environment, concentration. Too many hours in front of the computer. Eye surgery. Exposure and contact lenses. Okay. What's exposure? It's people that don't sleep with their eyes closed. So a large percentage of people actually sleep with what we call lag ophthalmos. Lag ophthalmos is where the actual eyelid comes only two thirds of the way down and it leaves a band of exposed cornea overnight. Okay, looks pretty freaky, yeah. Um, yeah, myasthenia gravis is, a, is, a, is an internal sort of systemic condition. Internal factors, I think we went through them, but let's see what we came up with. Aging, perfect. Gender and hormonal. I won't say which gender, which hormones. <laughs> medication. A lot of medication causes dry eye, yeah? Blepharitis, a lot of other anterior eye conditions can cause it, and autoimmune conditions, okay? So just some of the triggers that you sort of want to be in practice, you want to start to think about, okay, someone's come in with this. What else could be going on with their eyes? Okay, how we treat dry eyes. There's one way, which is adding tears. Okay, it's not the only way, but it's probably the easiest way out. And for the most part, they help. The problem with this is what? As soon as they stop, they go back to normal. Okay. So this is just a, essentially, it's just symptomatic relief. It actually doesn't fix anything. Um, I have no affiliation with any company. Um, they're just a random sample. <coughs> Second way we can treat dry eye, instead of adding tears, we can serve tears. So in the event that ocular lubricants provide little or no relief, we can actually insert punctal plugs. Okay? And what they do is that they actually increase the tears in the eye, at the volume of the eye. So we've all got two puncta, a little hole on the bottom, and actually one at the top. 90% of the tears go down, thanks to gravity, some of them go up. Okay? We put punctal plugs in there and what happens is uh, the tears don't drain as quickly and what you'll find is that sometimes it increases the, the tear volume at the surface of the eye and allows for, that, um, for, the, for the eye to be less dry. What's the problem with punctal plugs? What's the problem if you plug the drain? It comes out. Okay, So it doesn't work for everyone, particularly those that are more advanced in age. What happens is that their, tear, their, their lids are quite floppy, they sag, and a lot of the time you'll find that 
um, if their lids are not tight and actually anatomically turned in the right way, a lot of the time it's not a, not a useful sort of solution. Um, sometimes what can happen is that you can actually have a blockage of this puncture. Okay, so, so it happens actually more often than you would think. You actually find, we find in practice that patients come in and say, my eyes are really watery. And as soon as we hear that, we think there are so many things that could be. One of the things we do is we pull in the lid, look at the puncture, and it's completely blocked. Okay. And what happens is we get um, a syringe full of saline, and we do a lacrimal lavage. We actually essentially just put saline through there and push through that blockage. It can block up again every sort of maybe three to six months. And they need to come in again and get it done. They feel a bit of saline down their throat. Um, and they're back to normal. They're great. It works really well. So that's sort of the flip side of dry eye, but I thought I'd put that in as well as something else that can happen when you're playing around with the puncture. So just to bear in mind. So we said first thing was to add tears. Second thing was to try and conserve the tears that we already have. You can do both. And new natural supplements. Okay, there's a lot of studies that go on about natural supplements and the, the benefits of omega-3 tablets and, and other sort of... Um, uh, yeah, fish oils and, and what they do is they actually provide um, they provide nutrients to the oily layer, that mucin layer that I showed you at the very front of the eye. And if we can keep that intact, then we don't get evaporation of tears as quickly. <clears throat> Blink, drink, break. Okay, simple things that we can do on top of everything else. Okay, lots of water. Okay, believe it or not, there are studies that have been done that actually show that Excessive intake and hydration actually helps hydrate the eye as well. Um, avoid excessive heating and cooling. You might have to quit your job, but that's unfortunate. Um, so again, like I said, even with the pollen, you can't stay home. So some of these things are unavoidable, but they're just, you know, you may choose not to have the air conditioner heater on if you work in an office environment all day, for example. Uh, frequent breaks and blink more often, okay? You find a lot of people, they sit in front of a computer and they just stare. And if you watch them, they just don't blink. And when you do that over seven, eight hours, five times a day, 48 weeks a year, it does build up over time. Okay, so it happened last night, probably not dry eye. The pain, mild to moderate, probably not dry eye. Let's go on. Contact lenses. <clears throat> okay, so... There are a number of complications and they can come from a number of different sources. You can have traumatic uh, sort of contact lens complications, overwear, you, start, you get you sort of most people are between eight and ten years. Who wears contact lenses in this room? Anyone? One person, two, okay. Good, so this will be all new information for some of you. Um, you can get met met metabolic uh, causes for complications. You get swelling of the cornea. Neovascularization, so new blood vessels growing into the cornea. The, the cornea is the part of the eye that has no blood vessels, and we like it that way because the cornea has to be transparent. Okay, we can't have blood vessels in a transparent layer. What happens with new blood vessels generally? What do they do eventually? They hemorrhage. If we have hemorrhaging in a transparent layer, we're in big trouble. Okay, contact lenses causes neovascularization. Diabetes causes neovascularization. You can have toxic complications, okay, from the solution that you're using um, or just an allergic response. You can get papillary conjunctivitis. There it is. Who asked for the GPs, the, the papillary conjunctivitis? There okay, they're the cobblestones, different to follicles. Yeah? Um, so it's a hypersensitivity reaction. What happens is you can actually, because you've got the contact lens on the eye, you're blinking, okay, this is underneath your top lid that's blinking on the... That's blinking continuously over the contact lens. That, that physical rubbing um, all day can cause this hypersensitivity reaction. So it's this friction essentially between the under the eyelid and the cornea and the, con uh, the contact lens. And the bottom one you can get infective co complications. You can get a bacterial keratitis. Something like that, the eye is gone. Okay? That's not recoverable. And we'll talk about that. Okay, signs and symptoms of contact lens complications. Blurred vision, painful, unable to open, burning, um, itchy. It's generally in one eye, okay? Generally, if there's an issue with contact lens, it's probably more one eye than the other. 
In our case study, we want to be able to sort of differentiate between two types of contact lens issues. One is an infective problem, that's the worst one, and one is just an infiltrate, a sterile one. Okay? We go with the, um, with the, the pneumonic pedal, okay? a very easy one to remember. Is there any pain? Is there any defect on the front of the eye? Is there discharge? Is there any issues in the anterior chamber, which is just behind the cornea? And where is it? Is it centrally or not? It should be centrally if it's infective. If you just have a corneal infiltrate, which is sterile, there's no infection there, you get very little of that. Less pain, it's not central, um, there's no real defect on the front of the eye. Okay. How we treat them? We use antibiotics, gentamicin or tobramycin generally, or a fluoroquinolone. Okay. Um, and you can generally use sort of tobramycin or something less less uh, efficacious for, uh, for a sterile infiltrate. So when patient X attends, we look at their eye and we see that. Okay? We deem it as a corneal infiltrate. Result of hypoxic effect due to extended wear. Shock horror. Somebody overwore their lenses. Okay? That's probably one of the most common things we see as an optometrist. People come in, red eyes, they slept in their lenses, they had a big weekend, they just felt it was going to be okay because their friend was okay. okay. Mild to moderate pain, they need an antibiotic and they'll be fine. Number one or number two. Okay. I won't harp on this. Question? Well, it depends on the contact lens. So there are dailies that you can just wear, throw out before you sleep. Um, if they're monthly lenses, you can keep them for a month, but you need to replace them. You need to remove them every night. Um, generally, my recommendation would be not to wear them for any more than 10 to 12 hours during the day, and that means no naps. The next question is always, but can I nap in them? I don't know who's napping, to be honest, but anyway. <laughs> um, and then there are extended wear lenses. So extended wear lenses are ones that you can actually wear for 30 days without taking them out. Okay? For a long time in Australia, the extended wear lenses that were manufactured and, and brought in from the US as 30-day lenses um, we stuck to the principle that you could wear them for six days and then you had to take them out on the sixth night, spend the night without them and you could put them in the next day. Um, more recently that's sort of shifting to, because the technology is so good, the contact lenses are almost as breathable as not having them. Um, but that doesn't eliminate a lot of other issues, like if the fit is no good then it's going to be too tight on the eye, you're going to get hypoxic effects. If it's, if it's not fitting well, then the eyelid's going to rub on it, you're going to get hypersensitivity and, and giant and papillary. So there's a lot of other issues. Even if you can breathe okay with the lens, your eyes can breathe okay with the lenses, it doesn't eliminate a lot of the other issues that can come with sleeping in your lenses. Why you need to sleep in your lenses, I'm not sure. But some people prefer the convenience. They don't want to have to wash their hands to take them out. I think they should be washing their hands anyway, but I'm not sure why that's a problem. Um, they don't want to use the solution, they want to save money on solution or they just can't be bothered taking them out, rinsing them, putting them in the case next morning, putting them back in. So people have their rationale for everything. My, my recommendation is generally if you don't need to sleep in them, um, then don't. So if you're on a flight or something like that or you have to go somewhere where it's overnight, um, even on a flight, I'm almost certain that you can take them out, put them in your case and then wherever, whenever you land, put them back in. But anyway, to an answer your question in a roundabout way. Okay, let's move on from the three conjunctivitis, dry eye and contact lenses. When do we treat, when do we refer? Okay, so if it's mild, itchy, allergic, viral, self-limiting, we can get them Zatatin. Um, even if it's subacute bacterial or chronic bacterial, so, you know, it's sort of every month it gets a little bit sticky in the morning and then it's okay by the end of the day and it has, goes away for a two or three weeks and it happens again. You probably don't need antibiotics for that. But if there's a lot of discharge, it's always pussy, it's really painful, my vision, any time you see a loss in vision, no good, okay? Send them off to the optometrist. Um, or if it's one eye, okay? Any time it's one eye, we're more concerned. Because allergic is two eyes, viral conjunctivitis generally spreads from one to the other if you're sick. One eye is either contact lens, it's bacterial, or it's worse. Okay, can we push into the back of the eye now? Are we done with the front of the eye? Any questions on the front of the eye? Good. All right, we're almost on track. So hopefully these two conditions are conditions that 
uh, if nothing else you're familiar with, you know a little bit about, if you know nothing about, hopefully I touch on it enough to sort of highlight the main things. Mr J attends and he tells you that he takes medication for diabetes. Now I know, speaking to a very well-educated group of nurses, that when I ask this question, what do you ask, the list is as long as as long as Mims, right? But what do you ask about his eye? Thank you. Have you had a check? What else? Vision? Yeah. Yeah. What's it like normally? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay. How long have you had diabetes for? Control. What are your sugars like? Do you when when and how do you measure it? What's your vision like? Have you seen an optometrist? And when did you see an optometrist last? Okay, just some of the ones. And like I said, I'm realistic. I know that there's six things up there that some of them you'll ask, some of them you'll never ask, some of them you'll remember to ask sometimes. That's the nature of the business. But the more people we can remember, particularly things like number six, number four, they're probably the two that you want to remember the most in terms of the eye. What's your vision like? When was your last eye test? Okay. What is diabetic retinopathy? Essentially, it's a condition that is a complication of diabetes. Okay, it's a fairly significant one. It affects the small blood vessels and it result, results in the, in the leakage and hemorrhaging of the small blood vessels in the retina. So just like you have uh, damage to the small blood vessels in the kidney or wherever else or the periphery, the eye is another area where small blood vessels can be affected from diabetes. That's a healthy retina. All looks good. I don't need to tell you what that looks like. Okay, it's a dog's breakfast. That's what happens. If everybody, if, if the patient's sugar is under control, generally we won't see anything. If they're like your ideal patient, your like picture perfect patient, we generally will not see any damage to the eye. Who knows for how long? Roughly. So if the patient's perfect, they take their medication, they diet well, they exercise, they do everything they're told, how long can they go for with diabetes before we start to see damage to the eye? Forever? No, not forever. 15 is very close. 20 years. 15 to 20 years. Okay. Ultimately, patients that have had diabetes for longer than about 15 or 20 years will generally start to show some signs of diabetic retinopathy, even if it's just microaneurysms and little dot hemorrhages um, at that stage. So we're first. Correct. That's from. That's exactly right. Well, perfect point. Yeah. Thanks for raising that. So, when they come to you, or when we see them, and we ask them, it's generally not the most accurate measure. So, in terms of uh, in terms of, it's generally about the same. Unfortunately, yeah. So it's generally sort of that that sort of twenty year mark. 3% of the population over 55 have diabetic retinopathy. Okay, That's a big percentage. 22% of people with type 2 have some form of retinopathy related to diabetes. Within 15 years, 3 out of 4 will have diabetic retinopathy. Okay. Greatest risk is duration, Okay, as we just touched on. If you have kidney disease and type 1, because type 1 they've got diabetes for longer. So that's, they're more at risk to have some sort of retinopathy because they've, they're going to have it for longer. And it's the primary vision threatening condition for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. It affects the central vision. Okay, it's it's a it's it's random. They spot fires because the retina, as I said, is just so sparse. You think about a sphere. You think about a tennis ball and you cut it in half and you look inside a tennis ball, half a tennis ball. It's just a half a sphere. So it can happen anywhere. You can get hemorrhaging off to the side. Patients come and, come and see me after two or three years of not having an eye test. I've got diabetes. I look in there and there's a couple of little spot fires, a bit hemorrhaging here and there. But their central vision is fine. They have no idea. And that's why it's so important for them to get their eyes tested. Because you don't want to wait for the hemorrhage to go on the macula. As soon as we start to see a little bit of spot hemorrhages off to the side, we go, all right, off to the doctor. Let's get the blood, the blood, blood sugar checked. Let's get you on some more medication. Let's get the, the exercise right, the diet right. Let's get into a see a diabetes educator. Let's start getting this thing working because whatever you're doing isn't working. Uh, I think I've covered all that. They can't see. Hopefully, 
this is sort of obviously when the diabetic retinopathy is more central. I was just touching that first point. Early detection and treatment is essential. Okay, if we can start seeing those microaneurysms, those dot hemorrhages—they're not even dot hemorrhages; they're literally a pinprick. We start to see those in the eye. We start to sound alarm bells. Okay, because as early as that. In fact, what happens is when we pick it, up, pick it up that early, we can actually see the patient in 12 or 18 months and they can be gone. Okay, that diabetic retinopathy can actually go because that blood can get sucked back into the system. It's when it starts to then go within different layers of the retina, more anterior, that it starts to infect, that it actually starts to affect the, the vision. 98% uh, of severe loss can be prevented with early detection. This is focal treatment. So if you have some dot and blot hemorrhages just sort of around the macula, Okay, and around the optic nerve, you can do some focal laser treatment. So that's why I was asking about laser treatment, whether you're talking about diabetic laser treatment or refractive surgery, because there's laser treatment involved in diabetes. There's grid treatment. Okay, it's used to treat macular edema. Macular edema is a complication of diabetes. Okay, it's where the macula, the central part of the eye, starts to get thick and starts to uh, swell and get fluid um, as a complication of diabetes. And you can get uh, macular edema at any stage at very, very, very mild diabetic retinopathy and very severe diabetic retinopathy. Okay, there's no exclusivity there. <clears throat> and then there's pan-retinal treatment. Okay, so that's where we just sort of blanket bomb the retina. Okay, the idea is essentially to cauterize um, or stop the bleeding of the blood vessels. Uh, sometimes this sort of pan-retinal treatment can make vision worse than what they presented with but the idea is to make sure it doesn't get worse still by leaving the eye to hemorrhage out. Okay? So what do we counsel the patient on regarding his eye health? Control, control, control. Okay? Regular eye tests. Let us know if there's any change in vision and if there are any other symptoms. You start to get halos, you start to get flapping of curtains, you start to get any um, <coughs> flashes... So flashes is a, a very, it's like a red flag symptom in optometry and in any eye. So what happens is any time you get a flash, you know that the retina itself is being traumatised. Okay, the biggest thing that happens with flashing lights is retinal detachment and retinal tears. So any time somebody says, I have flashing lights, you can get flashing lights for other reasons. You can get them from migraines. If, if someone gets migraines, you'll, you know, you'll know that. But... One of the things that we're concerned most about with flashes is retinal detachment and retinal trauma, retinal tears, um, because essentially the, the retina is like the film in the eye, okay? and as soon as you pull on that, it starts to create this flashing effect. So flashes is one that you sort of, any time you hear flashes, any time an optometrist or any eye care for his flashes, alarm bells go off. And these flashes are coming all the time, <clears throat> They'll be intermittent. They They'll be intermittent, yeah. <laughs> They won't, be, uh, they won't be continuous. Uh, it's less in diabetic retinopathy, but it's more in things like retinal, retinal detachment, retinal trauma. Um, you can get a lot of people, soccer players that are heading the ball for years and years and years, uh, skydivers, bungee jumpers, a lot of them that have that sort of that real pull on the, on the eye, that gravity pull, will generally come in with weaker retinas and so a lot of them have retinal detachments. So... And like I said, one of the biggest risk factors is when the eye is really big from short-sightedness. So as you get more short-sighted, your eye gets bigger and bigger. The retina stretches. As the retina stretches, it's likely to just go split. Okay. If it's periphery, peripheral retina, if it's sort of out, it generally can be sort of... It's an emergency surgery. It has to be done sort of within... So you probably have about 72 hours to recover vision. If you don't do it within the first 72 hours, you're probably not going to have your vision again in that eye. So, um, or some vision. Glaucoma. How are we going for time? It's 10 o'clock. Okay, it's a disease that affects the optic nerve at the back of the eye. I showed you what that looked like. Um, due to increased eye pressure. Okay, Eye pressure has nothing to do with blood pressure. Please remember that. Okay, If anything, low blood pressure causes glaucoma, not high blood pressure. Okay, High blood pressure and high eye pressure are unrelated. Uh, relieving pressure on the nerve reduces progression of eye disease and eye early detection treatment slows, um, slows vision loss. This is the thief of sight. Okay? There are no symptoms. You have no idea until you start losing your peripheral vision and you start bumping into things that you have glaucoma. 
Again, essential that it's picked up through an eye test, the pressure in the eye is checked, pressure's good, the back of the eye looks healthy, away you go. People over the age of 40, um, 3% of the population again, and genetic links are huge in glaucoma. So as soon as somebody says, I have a brother or a sister or a father or mother, we go, you're at serious risk and make sure that all your siblings and all your family members get checked as well. Can't stop it. Okay, if they're going to get it, they're going to get it. We can't help that, but we, we can actually treat it. And like I said at the beginning of, of today, it's like hypertension in that if they're taking their medication for years and years and years, they'll be okay. First degree relative, eight times more likely to develop glaucoma. Okay, sad news. Risk factors. Age, big one. I, intraocular pressure raised... Another big one, race, gender, family history, extreme short-sighted, extreme refractory. So again, like I said, when the, the back of the eye is stretched, okay, this nerve starts to get damaged. That causes glaucoma. Okay? Diabetes, cataracts. And this is another big one. <coughs> Steroids. Okay? Use of systemic or topical. Any time a patient is on topical steroids, dexamethasone, Predford, anything that they're using as a drop, every time they come to the optometrist, um, they have to have their pressures checked. Okay, they can have a pressure spike. Generally, a pressure spike is okay. Come down if they've been on drops for two or three weeks for you know, some inflammation in the eye. It'll generally come, but it has to be monitored and kept close monitoring. Um, sorry, Never. <laughs> yeah, puffers, not so much. Preventers. Can, can, we, we've seen a spike in IOP from, uh, from the prevent, preventative um, asthma medication. Puffers, not so much. Um, uh, yeah. Good. So people that are on steroids for long-term autoimmune conditions, um, Crohn's and those sort of things, again, the pressure has to be checked very regularly. Okay? And you'll have no idea that their pressure is going up. There won't be headaches. There won't be sore eyes, there won't be red eyes, there won't be pain, there won't be anything until their vision's gone. I would say annually. Yeah, I would say every 12 months, 6 to 12 months. Um, glaucoma is extremely sl slow in progressing. But um, you'd be surprised how quick annually it comes around. <laughs> annually, sort of, you know, before you know it, another year's passed. Someone have a question? No. Someone have a question here? No? Okay. Functional implications. Okay. There's no functional implications. That's the scary part. Sorry, you may have said it, but do you have gender there? Is, um, is it more prevalent in males? It's more prevalent in males. Yeah. There is no functional implications. Okay, as I've touched on. Um, sometimes we can get blurred vision um, and angle cl and and uh, and halos but that's with a very different type of pressure. So, who knows what normal pressure in the eye should be? Anyone? 16, yes, yeah, good guess. Anything between 10 and 20 is normal. Okay? And it's the units are millimetres of mercury, MM, capital H, G. Okay, that's the normal pressure. 21 to 29, we sort of monitor, we look at other risk factors... We'll do a visual fields test. We'll see if there's any missing gaps in their visual field. If everything's okay, there's no family history. We generally will keep an eye on them. You know, if it's 28, 29, we we'll probably send them off to get some, put them on some um, lowering medication. Anything over 30, you probably want to act on. Okay, that's what we consider your open angle, your standard glaucoma that most people get. There's a different type of glaucoma called angle closure, where the angle at the front of the eye between the lens and the coloured part of the eye. The lens and the iris actually closes and it's essentially like basically putting a plug in the eye and you can get pressures as high as 60. Okay? That's a medical emergency. So that needs to be treated. Generally, they'll come in with headaches, nausea, vomiting, halos, blurred vision, very different glaucoma. That one, pressure needs to be relieved within hours and... Um, yeah, they need to be treated as a medical emergency. Okay, very different glaucoma. That's called angle closure glaucoma. Open angle glaucoma is what we're talking about here. The slow, silent, it's been sitting around 27, 28 for three or four years, keeps going up, never had an eye, haven't had an eye test in five years' time. All of a sudden they come in, 
We put them on the visual field. Does anyone, has anyone seen a visual field machine? I don't know what it looks like. It's like a big bowl. It's like a big bowl. You put your chin inside, you put your chin on the chin rest and you look inside it and the visual field machine, yeah, the visual field machine just flicks lights and you press a button every time you see it. Yeah, a few people are now recognising it. That essentially tells us on the spot if there's any missing gaps in your side vision. Okay? And people that have had extended periods of high pressure and haven't had an eye test in four or five years, sometimes you can actually find that they've got a little bit of a missing arc somewhere in their side vision. That's gone. Okay? There's no treatment. There's no, there's no fixing that. Okay? The cells have died. The optic nerve has died in that section. That, the, the, the nerve itself is no longer functioning, and that's it. So the earlier you pick it up, the better. Uh, it should be it should be almost instantaneous. You're talking seconds, but you know if you're sort of taking a minute or so to sort of adjust to the light, then there should be. It may not be glaucoma. It might just be that sort of you, the reaction time is a bit slower, but um, it shouldn't be taking minutes. Yeah. So what happens is I might have to go back to a slide, but. Do I have time to go back? I probably do have time to go back. Okay, I was starting to forget about that slide. So, um, that's your lens, yeah? And that's your iris. Between there and there, the fluid actually is travelling around, okay? And it drains outside the eye back into your system. When the iris, the coloured part of the eye, is stuck to the lens, there's nowhere for the fluid to go. So it shoots up. So what actually they have to do is they actually have to break what we call a sneaky eye, or the, or, the, or, the, or the attachment between the lens and the iris. So surgically, they have to remove that uh, in order to allow that fluid to go through. So it's a surgical procedure. Um, and I tell, I tell you this not in jest. One of the things that actually works initially, if you've got the patient in your chair, is a shot of whiskey. Um, the alcohol leaks to sort of 45, 48% alcohol in it can actually help reduce the pressure in the interim. Okay. There are some drops that can actually make the pupil size smaller. Okay. Pilocarpine makes the pupil really small and what that does too is that can actually break that, that attachment between the iris and the lens. Um, one thing you do not want them to do under any circumstances is to sit in a dark room because the pupil gets bigger, the attachment gets greater. Okay. So it's, They'll be vomiting, they'll be nauseous possibly, they'll have headaches, all that sort of stuff. Get them out in the open. If you have access to any sort of pilocarpine or the doctor has access to pilocarpine drop, it makes the pupil really, really small. Smaller the pupil, the likelihood that that attachment will break. Ultimately, though, they need to have surgery. What happens after surgery is that because these patients are more prone to have these attacks again, we do something called, we don't, the ophthalmologist does something called an iridotomy. So basically it's a laser, they, they poke laser holes in the iris, in the coloured part of the eye. Generally they'll do it in the coloured part of the eye under the lid because you don't want two pupils. What happens if you have two pupils? You have double vision because there's light coming in two different apertures. So they'll actually put a laser hole in the iris but under the lid and it actually allows that fluid to flow through that hole, that aperture that's been created through that laser hole um, and allows the fluid to remain down. They're likely to have an attack, but probably less likely. Okay, treatment is available, but early detection is the key. Loss of vision cannot be recovered. We've touched on that. Treatment aims to prevent further loss. <clears throat> Again, no affiliation. Some of the names you may have heard, Zalatan, Travaprost, uh, Timolol. Timolol we avoid with patients who have respiratory, they're beta blockers. Timolol is a beta blocker. So if a patient's got sort of any sort of respiratory condition and they come to you with a bottle of Timolol, you might want to ask the doctor or ophthalmologist or to prescribe something else. Question? No, I wasn't going to ask a real question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, there you go. So alpha GAN is another one. So there's a lot, of, a lot of drops. They act on different things. Some drops uh, 
create more of an outflow of the fluid into the eye to reduce the pressure. Other drops stop the production. Okay, so um, Zelatan is probably the most common glaucoma drug prescribed that actually allows for more outflow of the aqueous humour, the, the fluid in the eye, to reduce the pressure. Um, Alphagan and Timolol, they work on actually reducing production of the fluid. Okay, rather than they work on the mechanism to reduce production. So there are different mechanisms for treatment. Okay, I've got that in red for a reason. Okay, what's the problem with glaucoma treatment? Takes forever, and I don't have any different. Okay, you got pressure of 28. It's like having pressure of 18. Nobody knows any different. You put in a drop, in, it still feels the same. So they stop. Yeah. And that's when we start to see real complications. And it's good, you know, a lot of patients are really compliant for a year, two, five, but it's long term, okay? So that's where the real issues come. They're asymptomatic. And the other one is they can't put the drops in, okay? They finish half a bottle on their cheek, and that's it. In America, you actually get a bottle a month, okay? There's a system where you get, it's, it's, you can't just go and get a new script and get a bottle. So a lot of patients, they finish the bottle within 15 days, they put a drop, miss, they put another drop, half in, they get the third one in. 15 days in, they've finished the bottle and that's it. They've got nothing for the next 15 days. So a um, few considerations to think about with your patients around sort of putting drops in, someone to help them, carers, and just encouraging them to keep putting the drops in, even if you're asymptomatic. That's, that's good. Asymptomatic is good. It's what we want. And always it's good to refer them back to hypertension. Okay? You're not having a stroke. You don't have a heart attack, but still take your blood pressure medication. It's the same thing with your eyes. Regular eye examinations, okay, 50% are unaware and family history is really important. There we go on. Okay, good. Um, yeah, regular eye tests. You're more likely with a sibling, you're less likely with a parent and you're less likely, again, with a, an extended family, but you're still within that risk, risk profile, okay? Anyone in the family means you're within that risk profile. If you have um, a parent that has glaucoma or has had glaucoma, then you should be checked and not only should be, you should be encouraging all your siblings to be checked as well. Okay, it's 15 or 20 minutes or half an hour a year, everything's okay, away you go for another 12 months. But you won't know unless you've had the eye test. Okay, residential aged care. This touches a little bit on what we were just talking about with glaucoma and drops. Something that a lot of people in residential aged care don't know, that there are, there are oh, A, they don't know that they're entitled to an eye test. Okay? They don't know that someone can come out and give them an eye test. Uh, and that they will actually pay nothing out of pocket. There's a domiciliary loading as well as the rebate for the eye test itself through Medicare. Um, and there are also telehealth rebates now that optometrists provide. So I go in as, a, as, a, as an optometrist to a residential aged care facility. I detect someone has cataracts, for example. I can actually whip out my iPad, Skype into an ophthalmologist, talk to the ophthalmologist. He can see the patient, talk to the patient sitting next to me, and we can refer them in for cataract surgery. Okay. They don't need to go out and see an ophthalmologist anymore. Okay. This is across the board. There's no eligibility criteria. You don't have to be Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander. They don't have to be in rural and remote. Anyone in an aged care facility can access a telehealth Medicare rebate as well as a consultation to an ophthalmologist. Okay. So it's about access. It's about being able to identify and educate that, hey, this is available. Again, I don't know what your specialties and areas are but this is just across the board so for everyone to know. Main conditions, glaucoma, cataracts, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy. Okay. Administration of drops. One of the biggest things we see in aged care is that their eyes get worse because they don't put them in or they're not putting them in correctly or they don't have anyone to help them or whatever it might be. Okay. Just thinking about that. Um, when you come off cataract surgery, for example, you've had a lens rub taken out, like I said, not an eye disease, just want to emphasise, everybody gets it, it's just an aged care thing, it's just an age thing, um, and it only takes three or four minutes to do. Lens comes out, lens goes in, you need to be on two drops, an antibiotic, just to prevent infection, and a steroid, because you've had surgery. Okay? Which drop do you use first? Do I need to shake the steroids? Yes, you do. Do I have to wait between drops? Yes, I do. You guys all know what happens. You leave the specials with a bag. It's got two or three drops in it. Most of them don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah. There was a study done recently that showed that something like 70 or 80% of people that left the GP office actually don't remember what they were told. 
So someone stood out there as part of a study and sort of said, what were you told? Most of them don't remember. They nod and they smile. They, they, smile, they nod at the right times and they smile at the right times. They don't remember what you're telling them. Um, and so this is where education and where real patient care comes in. Okay? What drops do you have? What are they for? It actually says it on the bottle. Shape this drop. Generally you wait five minutes between. And there are, there are little sort of drop, drop, droppers, if you, know, if you know what I'm talking about. So they can actually assist in allowing you to administer drops. Glasses. Another thing we see in aged care. Somebody's reading, put their glasses down, and what do they do? They walk off. Somebody else comes and sits down, picks up the glasses and puts them on. And you're done. Okay? So labelling them is really helpful. Maybe just charting what they're for, you know, whether they should have them or not. Okay, people feel that they need glasses, their glasses, I'll just take these glasses. Okay, so really important just to think a little bit about whether it's in a residential aged care facility or whether it's just in general practice or wherever you're working, that some of these issues may come up. Anyone with glaucoma, these things are, these things are, are really important to think about. Um, glaucoma, again, I'll just touch on it quickly. Some drops are only supposed to be administered in the morning because they take eight or nine hours to work and the peak, um, the peak pressure spikes later in the day. It's important you take that drop in the morning. Take that drop at night, it works eight or nine hours later, then when the, when the IOP is highest, it's not going to be effective. Okay? Children's screening. Getting to the end, guys. You've been really patient with me. I know it's a lot of information, but, um, but yeah, there's a lot to cover. Children's screening. So visual acuity. I'm not sure who's had an eye test and who remembers about their eye test, but 2020 or 6.6 .6 is what we aim for. Generally, kids that are sort of one line better than 6.6. .6. A 6.6 .6 is this line here. Okay. It's tested, it's a specific size, and it's tested at 6 metres. Okay, that's why it's 6 on 6. Okay, so it's 6 degrees at 6 metres. So you say to me, how come my optometrist's room is so small and I get really claustrophobic and I feel like I can't breathe in there? And I say, because he's got a mirror. So you sit only three metres away, but then there's a mirror at the end of the room and the chart's behind you. So he's made up the six metres that way. Okay? But it is still six metres. You're always being tested at six metres. Okay? Um, generally, a, generally, somewhere between 6'6 six, six and 6'9 six, is where we want the kids to be. Um, anything less than that, generally they need to be referred in for an eye test. Okay? I've got screen time there. Screen time is a big thing now. Yeah, she laughs. Yeah, I can, I'm terrible. My kids both are addicted to IT, so I can't, I can't talk. But theoretically, this is what kids should be doing. Okay? Between zero and two, they shouldn't be using screens. Okay? No iPads, no computers, no phones. Can't keep them quiet in the trolley with an iPhone. Okay? Shouldn't be. Why? Why? Was that your question? No, I would say the same. Probably more near. Near, near, near screen rather than distance. The reason for why is that it's, the studies have shown that near um, viewing uh, can actually contribute quite significantly to short-sightedness. Okay? And they're more susceptible to being short-sighted as they're younger. As their eyes develop, they're, they're, less, they're less likely to be to develop. So it's not the only thing that's going to... I mean, you could have a, a child never, never, use the, never use a screen and still be short-sighted based on their race and gender and everything else. I don't like that word. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't because, yeah, I mean, it's theoretically this is what you should be doing. Um, realistically, it's not. It's not feasible. Okay, but um, ideally, they shouldn't be having any exposure to screen time before two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could be anything, but most likely, the 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 issue is that he's got blurred vision in that eye, okay? Because he's seeing blurry out of that eye, he just wants to cover it, or he wants to be a pirate, but that's a different. Thing. You can test three months old. You can test six months old. There are tests to show, there are tests to be able to determine what their acuity is, uh, without actually them giving you any information. 
Okay, so there are, there are tests. There's one test called retinoscopy. It's a test where an optometrist will actually shine a light in the in the child's eye um, from about two metres, between one and a half and two metres. So it doesn't actually get inside the eye like what we were talking about, the back of the eye, but it's about two metres away. And looking at the reflection and the direction of the reflection can actually determine if there's any short-sighted, long-sighted, if there's astigmatism, and you can pick that up from sort of three or six months old. Yeah. Um, yeah, so any, at any age, okay, if there's an issue at any age, definitely before school, if they haven't had an eye test, I, I would, uh, being an optometrist, I'd probably get my kids tested before school, but I just think it's good practice not to wait until they're five to see pick up a problem, particularly that things like lazy eyes, and that can be corrected through patching and all that if you pick it up early enough. So after the age of eight, um, you know, with patching, the idea with patching is that they have one lazy eye and one really good eye, and you actually patch the good eye and get the brain, to, the eye to talk to the brain for those neural connections to work so that the vision gets better. And the idea is every six to eight weeks you see that kid again and every time they should be coming down the chart. Okay? Sometimes they need glasses as well as the patch so that they can have optimal vision and still patch the good eye so the bad eye is seeing as well as it can with the glasses and then hopefully the vision gets better and better and they get further down the chart. Um, by eight that's gone. Okay, so the, the brain's sort of quite flexible and malleable until about eight. After that, it gets quite difficult to push them further down the chart. So the earlier you pick that up, the better. Um, and yeah, you can determine that they've got like a plus five, plus six prescription, and that, that eye is quite long-sighted, and that needs that needs work from as early as three or three or four months. Uh oh, yeah. Yep. So behavioural optometry is uh, it's a it's a branch of paediatric optometry. Okay, it's I won't say it's not uh, it hasn't stood the test of time. Personally, I think that there is some validity to what they do. Okay, um, in any branch, you'll find that there are extremes. Okay, so extremes where they say that they can actually help kids with dyslexia and those sort of things. Um, I'm yet to see. But there are also areas of behavioural optometry around muscle training, um, ability to sort of, you know, focus on particular numbers and just make sure you know they're not skipping numbers and those sort of things and training through you know visual eye movements. Those sort of things I think are fairly legitimate. Um, the important thing to remember is that behavioural optometrists generally have started out and work quite well with kids that have general optometry issues like turned eyes, lazy eyes, you know, being able to pick up really short-sighted and long-sighted kids. So, you know, if my kid was walking around like this, I'd definitely be taking him to a paediatric optometrist. Whether he actually worked in behavioural optometry as well and assisted kids that did that, to me, what's important is that they're able to do the paediatric stuff really well. So a behavioural optometrist is generally an optometrist that specialises in kids. We're not allowed to use the word specialises, but he's an expert in kids. And he does all the stuff that I've put up there, the other stuff like turned eyes and, and, and lazy eyes really, really well. They've got all the equipment. They're really good at being able to pick that up and get the right pair of glasses and, and they work well with kids. Whether all the behavioural stuff works long term and what scope that is is, a, is, a, is up for debate. Yeah, but some of, it, some of it is fairly legitimate in my opinion. When you say turned eye and lazy eye... Different. They They're completely different. Okay, so one of them is where you have two eyes are straight, one eye sees perfect, and one eye sees really poorly. That's a lazy eye. Okay, the other one is where you have one eye there and one eye over there. You see, like we used to be told, told cross-eyed, the kid that looks a little bit funny. Well, funny is a bad word, but like the eyes turned in or the eye turned out, um, they can still have good vision. So I have a turned eye. So I have. My right eye is looking at you, my left eye is slightly turned. As a child, my right eye would sometimes do that, my left eye would look at you, and then it would be like that. So because I had an alternating turn, both eyes saw really well. And sometimes it can turn after the neural connections have all been made, so you actually see really well, and then at five, six, or whatever, the eye can turn. By that stage, both eyes are seeing well, one eye can be turned. You've got options of things like squint surgery, so you can actually have uh, turned eye surgery, 
shorten the muscle eye comes in. You need a paediatric ophthalmologist to do that. And if it's generally due to a muscle being shorter or longer. Um, what can also happen in younger, younger kids, so sometimes you see like babies that are three, four, five months, they'll have eyes that are turned in. Sometimes, miraculously, they've just got a really, really significant case of um, being long-sighted. And you put on the right pair of glasses and their eyes go zoom. Perfect. They don't need surgery, they don't need anything. But they're wearing thick glasses for sometimes the rest of their lives. Okay? And it's just a matter of that. that their prescription is so high that the eyes turned in. Other times it is a muscle issue. You need a fairly good pedi paediatric ophthalmologist to, to actually do a, um, what we call squint surgery or, or turned eye surgery to shorten the muscle, one of the muscles, to make the eye straight. Um, but that's, that's fairly significant. Okay, I've only got about five minutes and I've got maybe three slides to go. Okay. Red flags. How do I know that I'm dealing with something that I just want to handball straight out of my practice because I don't want to have anything to do with this? Um, sudden onset. Okay? Symptoms are severe. My eyes just gone. Black. Can't see out of my left eye anymore. Um, I've got a tree branch sticking out of it. Right? <laughs> um, well, if you watch Grey's Anatomy, it happens all the time. So. Um, and in suspicious stuff. Slurred speech, headaches... Um, loss of coordination, mental confusion, all those things you just sort of, yeah, I don't want to deal with. But um, So you would generally refer that off, okay? So red flags are generally sudden. Well, I mean, the, the bottom one is probably not as common. The top ones are, okay? All of a sudden I've lost vision in the right eye. I woke up this morning and it's just gone, okay? Um, and you're talking things that could be uh, neurological related, so it could be things that are like, you know, strokes and, and other things that have caused that... Um, that, that vision to go. Or retinal detachment and those sort of things. Okay, today, today, one to two days. Okay, so ED now. Vision loss, darkening of vision, double vision. Okay, double vision you don't want. You don't want in your rooms if it's double vision. Okay, you get that straight out. Um, severe pain, penetrating foreign body. When I say penetrating, so optometrists can remove foreign bodies from the front of the eye. Okay. Metal, um, you know, little sort of splinters, all those sort of anything that gets in the eye at the cornea can be referred. They've got a Medicare rebate for that item. They'll put, we'll put them on antibiotics. They'll be fine by, by dinner time. They'll have a story to tell their kids, but that's fine. They're flicking out. Penetrating is when it's come high velocity and it's gone inside you. So it's an intraocular foreign body, not a superficial one. Uh, optometrist or GP, red, red eye, blurred vision, foreign body, one to two days. You've got a bit of mild pain. It might be bacterial conjunctivitis. It's a bit puffy. Uh, I'm getting some floaters. Um, flashes, I probably would push that up. Okay? Flashes, I wouldn't leave it one to two days. If I had to write that slide again, I would change that. So that's, that's something that we want to act on today. Chemical burns and splashes. Irrigate the eye for 15 minutes and then go straight to ED. Okay, saline running tap water, just get whatever you can in there to clear the eye, okay? Um, I was, I've was i just been nominated as first aid warden for our office, um, so I was really excited about that. But um, someone in the group at, the, at St John's in the, actual, in the actual training said, I wanted to know whether they could put beer in the eye mm -hmm. because if you're camping and something gets splashed in the eye, whether that, that, if that's all he had on him, the answer is no. Okay, so... Um, Oh yeah, and remove contact lenses. Okay, don't leave the contact lenses in. Okay, if there've been chemicals in there, chances are they're in the matrix of the contact lens themselves, probably seeping into the eye. Get the contact lens out. Okay. And thank you for listening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not easy. It's not easy if you've got the. Um, so I think I find that what works best is the um, the little tubes of sterile saline. If you have them back, so if, I, I don't know what sort of access you have to sort of a chair where they put their head back or a table even, um, a bed, yeah, okay. Um, just don't drown them, but yeah, you know, bed's okay. Um, and just put a, like a, a tissue, put a tissue or something on their cheek and lower the, lower the lid and just constantly irrigate inside the fornix, inside the lower conjunctiva, because they'll blink. So that'll just constantly just wash over the eye. If you can get it into that lower sac of the eye, um, 
generally that's enough for when they blink to wash that saline across the cornea. The main thing you're worried about is the cornea. Okay? The conjunctiva is gelatinous and the sclera is really hard and there's nothing that's going to, nothing, the worst part is it's going to get red. That's not the end of the world. But what you want to make sure you're irrigating is the cornea. So as long as you've got that saline in there and they blink, you're washing over that cornea with the, with the eyelid. Give that a shot. Uh, no, I don't think there's ever a time it's pointless. It'll probably happen straight away because they'll probably come in straight away. <laughs> so you'll see them immediately. Um, but uh, if you don't have it, like I said, you're alternatively running tap water, but it's a preferably sterile saline. Yeah, that works. That works. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it's for everyone. So it's a good question. It's probably not related to eye disease, but it's good, worth touching on anyway. So generally, most people will get a pair of glasses for being short-sighted or long-sighted. And if you don't have an anti-reflective coating on the lenses, you'll start to get these sort of star effects coming off all the street lights, headlights, brake lights, everything that's in front of you. Um, what the only thing that really works really well is to, is to recommend the patient get an anti-glare coating or an anti-reflection coating on the lenses. If you have a look at your own pair of glass and you've got it, you'll see like a greenish purplish tinge coming off your lens. So if I look at mine, I can see a green tinge. Um, it's, it's all, it should almost be mandatory now on every pair of glasses that people wear because it's just, it, it looks nicer and it's actually safer on the road. But yeah. I think we're probably just on time, 10.28. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah. Um, is there any of no. No, it's a common question. It's actually something that we hear almost on a daily basis. Is there anything I can do to help my eyes? The answer is no. Well, no is guarded. Well, things like protection, UV protection is really important. Um, you know, all the tips we've spoken about, sort of avoiding allergens and drinking and blinking and, and avoiding air conditioned heating, all those things are important. But f to prevent eye disease, Regular eye test is the only way to be, in order to ensure treatment. Yeah, mentioning the ingredients. There's some new treatments around the dry eye now with spray on the outside. Yeah. Is it common? Yeah. Um, the spray is probably not as effective. Okay, because they... I haven't tried it, so I don't know. And I, I don't... I haven't put any patients on it. Uh, not to my knowledge. There may be, but I, I, can't, I can't answer that. The reason it's not as effective is that the actual instructions tell you to close your eyes. Um, and it's, the idea is it's supposed to sort of seep in somehow. I, I don't know. But, um, yeah, it's not going to be as effective as putting a drop in your... The, the actual product and what's in it might be effective, but I don't know how it penetrates your skin and eyelid enough. Yeah. I got no more comments on that one. <laughs> Thanks, Morris. Simon, look, just behalf on of Hapner, thank you very much. Pleasure. For very thank you for having me. Thank you. Oh, and that's a small thank, you. Say thank you very much. My pleasure.